Well, thank you, uh, everybody, for being here, and thank you, Frank, for uh, putting this event on. Uh, thank you, all the speakers who have already said basically what I could say uh, and more. Um, I have been incredibly emotional for the last few months. I live up in a small town in Arcata, California, where every uh, Friday our Veterans for Peace chapter vigils on the plaza in silence uh, with the women in black to our, uh, to the, in the other corner of the plaza. And the silence has been more healing to me than talking, and so I actually haven't been speaking that much. Uh, I've been, uh, of course, reflecting and uh, talking to lots of people in small groups. Uh, but um, I felt so emotional, I'm never, I'm never sure what I'm going to be able to say and whether I'll be able to uh, keep my composure. And to ground myself right now, I think I will just tell you how my initial um, awakening happened. Um, I was a, like Ron Kovic and so many others, I was just a regular guy, but I was from a small farming community of 350 people in upstate New York. And uh, I thought that America was uh, the greatest country in the history of the uh, world. I, unlike Joel, <coughs> didn't have any <coughs> ambivalence. I was <coughs> a total believer in everything that our government said, and my church said, that my parents said, that my school said, and it was a wonderful story. It was an incredible, an incredible story. How could you complain about it? It was like a fairy tale. Um, it was, and, and in fact, it, it is a make-believe story. But it took me a long time to figure it out. And, and the way it happened was, I happened to be in Vietnam in 1969, uh, seemingly in a relatively uh, safe position. I was an Air Force officer in charge of a security unit that was protecting an air base 100 miles south of Saigon. So I wasn't out in the boonies looking to kill people. We were defending ourselves from attacks, so we were always on the defensive. We had, I had 40 men, and we had, um, we had 10 machine guns, we had mortars. Um, we were well defended. But my boss, who was a Vietnamese colonel, asked me to do an extra duty for him. He said that some of his South Vietnamese pilots were missing their targets. And I hadn't thought too much about the bombing and the targets. Uh, I'd only been there like three weeks. And I was basically uh, very studiously studying intelligence reports to make sure that we were that we could secure the base from attacks from all sides. And um, he said he wanted me to go with one of his lieutenants, whose name was Bo, a Vietnamese lieutenant who was educated in Mississippi, who spoke good English. And he wanted us to go, partly because his Jeep had been blown up and I still had my Jeep intact, and he needed somebody to go to these villages after the airstrikes and do a ground assessment of the bombings of whether these targets had been hit or not. And the targets, it turns out, were villages. The very first village that we went to was in April of 1969. And I didn't know how to get to it, but Bo directed me on these dirt roads along the Basak River. And we were there within 10 or 15 minutes of the end of the bombing, and this whole village had been uh, virtually destroyed. It, isn't, it wasn't very difficult. They're like mounds in the rice paddies. There's no vegetation. Uh, there were no guns there. There was no defenses. It was 11 o'clock in the morning. Um, and two planes or three planes could unload their uh, few bombs and their napalm bombs and destroy everybody. So the scene I saw was um, probably about 120 corpses uh, or bodies lying on the ground 
and maybe 60 of them were dead. I couldn't tell for sure. But at my feet, there was a woman who was holding, had, was trying to hold three children. She would obviously was, had been fleeing the bombing, and all of a sudden they were two feet from, the, from my feet. And her eyes were open. And I thought maybe she was alive, so I bent over. And I started crying. And, uh, of course, they were dead, but the napalm had burned off their skin and their eyelids. And um, I was gagging. And Bo, this Vietnamese lieutenant, asked me what my problem was. And, of course, I had never been in this place before. This was a brand new place for me. Never have I ever experienced anything like this. I didn't have any plan. This was just what came out. And um, I said something in response to Bo's question, which has mystified me to this day, but it also has taken me into deep places of consciousness. I said, without even thinking, looking at these people on the ground, I said, this is my family. Now, I was from a, you know, a lower working class family in upstate New York. My father was a fuller brush salesman. You know, there was no intellectual discussion in my family. There was no uh, questioning going on. Um, I don't know where that came from at that moment, except from some very ancient place that was a truth. I, we really are all family. We are all part of the human family. And he laughed and said, um, this was a victory. These were all communists. And it just didn't mean anything to me from that point on. It was just a, a, a worthless ideological um, conditioning. And I realized at that point, standing there, I was cognizant of uh, not where that answer came from, but I was cognizant that I was no longer one of the good guys on the planet, and that I was, um, you know, I had a lot of karma that I had to deal with. Uh, I mean, I, it, was, it was really pretty unbelievable that uh, I could have followed an order to go halfway around the world. I, I mean, I know a lot of vets might feel this way, but this is really <clears throat> how I experienced it, because I had been a good student in my school. I had been valedictorian honor society student council. Um, you know, I'm supposed to be, a, I'm supposed to know something. I'm supposed to be able to ask questions. And um, I realized that I was very disabled. That was the word that came to me. I'm very disabled because I can't see. I haven't been trained to see. I, I, I just felt so, uh, um, uh, unbelievably uh, um, ashamed that I had, I was standing in that village. It was not my village, it was these people's village. And I was 10,000 miles from my hometown. How could that, how could that be? So shortly thereafter, I happened to uh, find a book in the library at my little air base. Uh, the book was entitled The United States in Vietnam by Kahin and Lewis, two Cornell University professors. And I read that book, and I couldn't believe that I didn't know anything about the history of Vietnam or the French and the U.S. intervention in Vietnam. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that I, I, I was all the way over to Vietnam. I already had a master's degree. I was already a commissioned officer. I was 27 years old. And I didn't know anything about how the French-Indochina War ended and how the United States sabotaged the peace, how we manufactured South Vietnam, we created a fiction, and then we brought DM from the United States, from a Mary Knoll Seminary in New Jersey, to Vietnam to be our man. So that was a, an incredible moment. That all happened in, a, in like a week, uh, where I was like, um, I was in shock that 
we were destroying systematically all these villages in the Mekong Delta. Every village was targeted. Every village was targeted for bombing. They would just do three or four every day. And so that was the beginning of my awakening. It wasn't maybe not a typical experience, but each Vietnam vet has a different experience and a different history. It's, it's, it just depends on where you were and when you were there and what you were doing. I spoke out against the war, of course, and I was sent home after 151 days um, with many ch uh, court-martial charges against me, all for sedition. Um, they even brought a lawyer from Canto City an army lawyer to read me my rights at this little air base. Uh, I was just like, I mean, I was talking about Nuremberg. I was talking about Army Reg 2710 that says you're not supposed to kill civilians and civilian targets. I knew, and I knew that much. It kind of came out like, wow, we're committing war crimes. <laughs> that isn't what I came here to do. And then, of course, as I started studying history, I realized I really did realize about the make-believe story of this civilization. How we stole the land at gunpoint, we stole the labor at gunpoint, and we stole the resources at gunpoint from all over the world. We have built an entire civilization on a lie, on a series of lies and pretexts that sound very noble, sound very, very rational and very um, justifiable. I, I spent many years traveling to Latin America and to the Middle East, studying the history and nature of U.S. policy, and I'd come home, and I would try to talk to my own family, and it was not possible. They could not comprehend the cruelty and the, and the bellicosity of what the United States policies were doing, either overtly or covertly. I mean, it really is hard for people to grasp how incredibly demonic Western civilization has been, in not just the United States. And so we've been given a cosmic gift, I believe, in disguise with George Bush. Uh, I mean, I mean, really, 9-11 and Bush's response to it um, is like, I, I believe it's like a cosmic gift that's been given to us just in time to get it, to get that we have been really butchering the planet for centuries. We have been murdering people for centuries, not even, most of us not even knowing it, not even thinking about it, not, don't even want to think about it. Why would you want to upset this fairy tale? I mean, it really was a wonderful story. It just wasn't true, and it isn't true. And this is, this, as Ron and others have said, this is a pivotal evolutionary moment in human history, and it is a moment both of dark peril and of incredible, unusual opportunity to, in a sense, undo and redo culture. Western culture, at least. We have, this is not just an anti-war movement. We have to build a justice movement, and we have to go beyond and articulate a vision for the alternative. And this vision, I don't think, includes nation-state structures. This vision includes taking our responsibility as human beings and letting our imaginations liberate, liberate our imaginations that have been so locked up for so long, very conditioned to fit certain patterns of life. Now we know that what our way of life will do will destroy the planet. We know it. We, you can see it right at the end of your nose. You can see that Western civilization is at its end and that violence and war is going to kill uh, not only our species, but of course many other species, and it already has. So we've learned something 
And we've had 30 years of people talking about this demythologizing the make-believe version of our civilization. We've had uh, Chomsky and Zinn and lots of other speakers and vets and ex-CI agents who finally have been talking about, finally it's, it took Vietnam, I think. It took, uh, it took the, the humiliation of Vietnam to our nation to open up in the psyche this uh, willingness to begin telling the truth this terrible truth, it's like, God, I didn't even want to acknowledge the truth for several years. It was so painful to realize as I studied uh, U.S. history and as I studied world history and then I studied anthropology to study the history of human evolution and then I studied physics and got into quantum physics trying to understand all the levels, all the dimensions of, of life. I studied Jungian psychology, also as a patient often with Jungian psychi psychiatrists, <laughs> just in my own healing process, learning about my shadow and how shadows get projected on other people. And that works for nations too. Everything that we say about uh, Iraq or Saddam Hussein is, a sh is our own shadow. We're looking at the images of ourself <laughs> when we project them on others. So this is, this is, really is an extraordinary moment to be alive. As, as emotional as I have been feeling, I, I've actually felt, I told my therapist this, I feel like I'm in suspended animation. Like my head is hanging uh, in such a way that my, my artificial legs are dangling off the ground and that, I, and that my body's kind of in a quiver. And... Um, that I'm seeing two trains coming towards each other, the biological evolution and cultural evolution coming at breakneck speed for this big collision. And that I'm hoping that we as human beings, especially in the West, especially in the United States, can create a new culture, a new consciousness that will at least cause a sideswipe rather than a head-on collision uh, so that we might actually survive uh, whatever Bush is, is going to do, maybe, maybe in the next two weeks uh, there will be far more uh, things happening in the, in the movement in the United States that we can't even t predict right at this moment because things are happening so fast. And if you study chaos theory, you've probably heard about the butterfly effect. Basically, very small incidents can create huge implications that can't be predicted. It's, the, the metaphor is the butterfly that flaps its wings in Brazil creates a tornado in Texas. That's the phys how the physicists try to explain it. And if you study quantum physics, you realize that at the subatomic level, there's so many energy fields that, are, that we're all part of that we have not even been, you know, we've been operating as if we're in this kind of Newtonian material world, but there's also this spiritual world, there's this new understanding of how the cosmos works and how we're all part of it. And we've been living as if we're separate from it. And so this paradigm shift is pretty staggering. Uh, it's pretty uh, powerful because it puts us in, back into harmony with um, the, the whole cosmos, the energy fields of the cosmos from which we've always been part of. And if, uh, sometimes people ask me, what is my vision of the future? And I say, well, I'm now living in a small farming community in Northern California, so I don't have to drive much. I, use, I cycle everywhere on my hand cycle, uh, except I did drive to Los Angeles. Uh, and I don't like to fly. Um, and that I'm trying to rediscover what it was like to live in a Neolithic village with Buddhist economics and appropriate technology kind of synthesized uh, in a bioregion. So I have a bioregional address. It's the Mad River Watershed in northern Humboldt County. Uh, trying to actually conceptualize this manner in which we really are living with the earth. The mother is our... our is our teacher. Uh, indigenous people are our teachers. Um, uh, silence is our teachers. It's amazing 
to us vets that stand in silence on the plaza in this little arcada um, how much power we feel by standing in silence for just one hour a day, just silently standing, just reflecting, just kind of in a meditation. Uh, I mean, the, these are kinds of dimensions of, of um, power and encouragement that uh, put us in a place we haven't been before. And so uh, I've, been, I've been trying to uh, be thanking the Great Spirit for this cosmic gift in disguise, even though I'm scared to death. Um, you know, the, the Patri Patriot Act II, which hasn't passed yet, um, you know, makes the Patriot Act I uh, real tame. It actually authorizes the Attorney General of the United States to identify people, U.S. citizens, as terrorists if he simply suspects that their activities are threatened, are interfering with the war on terror. And it authorizes deportation of U.S. citizens. I don't know where they're going to deport them to. <laughs> but it actually authorizes it in the new legislation. And the word that I get is that the legislation may be introduced whenever Bush decides to go to war or escalates the war. Um, so, you know, this is uh, something that uh, we really have to be together uh, to, to uh, resist and non-cooperate with this government in almost any way we can, including going on strikes, including tax resistance, um, including taking days off from work, taking days off from driving, taking your money out of the stock market if it's there, but Basically, this empire can only function with our complicity. And it will only fall when we decide that we no longer will allow this government to exist. Now, now I'm not talking about violence. This is nonviolence. This is never giving them a reason to do what they did to me, for example. You know, I was shocked. When I was in the hospital, after being run over by the train, thinking I was going to go to jail, but not having any memory of actually being hit. And the first question from the investigator, with my lawyer present at my side, uh, probably a week or 10 days into my hospitalization, the first question was, when did you plan to hijack, at what point did you start planning to hijacking the train? And I was like, hijack the train? Uh, well, then I learned what had happened during the fast the year before, the four of us sitting on the steps drinking water for almost seven weeks. We were, for some bizarre reason, considered by the government a threat. So they identified, the FBI identified us as suspects in a domestic terrorism inquiry. Now, we would, didn't know that at the time, but while we were fasting, Senator Warren Rudman, who was at that time was a senator in New Hampshire, uh, was quoted in the Boston Globe as saying that he likened the fasting veterans to Middle East terrorists. It was the first clue we had of how they were thinking. I have that Boston Globe headline in my scrapbook because it was such a, a it was like, what is going on here? Well, then our office was broken into two days later and our records taken. We had a, a Veterans Fast for Life office. But we still weren't putting two and two together. It wasn't until after the investigator asked me when I, was, uh, when I planned to hijack the train, uh, and then we, in, in the uh, interviews with the train crew, they admitted that they had been ordered that morning not to stop the train under any circumstances because they expected us to board the train. And then a month later, somebody called me from Illinois and said there was an FBI agent that had just been fired for refusing to investigate the Veterans Fast for Life as terrorists. His name is Jack Ryan. He's another hero. He's another one of these unsung heroes. He lost his job after 20, almost 22 years in the FBI. He took his case to the Supreme Court and lost. But then Jack Ryan 
turned over the orders that he had been given so that we had a copy of the orders uh, that had been submitted to him and many other agents to investigate us fasters as terrorists. And that was the reason I lost my legs, because they had in their minds uh, that we were terrorists, or at least that I was a terrorist. And one other veteran that was with me on the tracks had also been part of that fast. So there were two terrorists in their minds. And I guess they just, their paranoia goes, as we know it does, it goes crazy and, and, and goes wild. Uh, so when I read the Patriot Act II, I think, gee, I was called a terrorist in, under Reagan for sitting on the steps drinking water. Uh, of course, we were protesting Reagan's policies in Central America, but it was a staggering thing to realize that uh, when people would say, well, at least you have the freedom to demonstrate in the United States and protest. And I said, yeah, but I didn't think I'd lose my legs for doing it. And I was like, oh, they hadn't thought of that. Maybe, maybe the freedom isn't quite that crystal clear. So at any rate, this is a very, it is a perilous time. We, we, uh, are, we have been given a government. Uh, actually, if, if Gore had been, his, had been president, which is his legal right, we wouldn't be in this. But we wouldn't be where we're at because Gore is a friendly fascist. And Bush is a real bold one. He really says it clearly. There's no masking now. It's all out there. We are premeditating mass murder against the world, if so inclined, depending on the day, Iraq's first, with the use of nuclear weapons. And they're now talking about their new, um, uh, this new um, E-bomb, they call it. Um, it's, it's uh, what is it? Yeah, this is, it's a, uh, it, it, put, it, it knocks out all electricity. It knocks out every radio, it knocks out every line with one blast of voltage. And um, I suppose they figured out how to do it without interrupting their own electronic communications. They're, they're usually that smart, I guess. Well, maybe not. Uh, but actually, um, since life is un so unpredictable, uh, nobody knows what's going to happen. But we do know, we do know that we have a duty, an obligation, a responsibility as human beings. We've been on a seven million year evolutionary journey as a bipedal species. We have everything we've created, nations, states, armies, male dominator roles, hierarchies, oligarchies. We created them, our species. We chose to create them, and we also chose to be complicit with them and to, in some ways, go along. Maybe because there was a lot of force involved. Maybe there was a lot of guns involved pointed at us. But in some way, we have all been compl complicit with this model. And the, the, the model I just described goes back five, six, seven thousand 7,000 years. This is not even new to what we call Western civilization. Male dominator, oligarchic, bureaucratic, hierarchic, violence. This is an old model with the masses going along at gunpoint as the laborers. Well, we now know that is going to end if we are going to continue as a species. So we know we've learned a lot. We have this capacity now to create our separation, our liberation, our breaking free from the model that we all grew up in believing in. We now know that model is going to destroy us all. And, and by the way, I, I do believe that Bush's policies are inevitable if the American way of life wants to continue as it is. I mean, it, it is true that what Bush is proposing uh, is necessary if the American way of life wants to continue business as usual, under the delusion, of course, that it could go on forever. So that's why I think it's a blessing that we've been given this bold, cruel, uh, incredibly criminal uh, position that's stated so boldly that we can't miss it. I mean, a lot of people now can't miss it. It's just, if, I mean, I thought I was d dumb in Vietnam. Uh, and when I read that book, I couldn't believe that I didn't know 
anything about Vietnam or why we were there except we were fighting communists. Now we know that the American way of life, I call AWOL, really does, really does require stealing everything at gunpoint. We have to have everything to maintain this incredible, insatiable, consumptive way of life, which is, which is a crime against nature in and of itself. So coming to grips, all of us coming to grips with this huge historic paradigm shift is our challenge. It goes way beyond stopping the war with Iraq. It begins with building a justice movement and it begins, it goes beyond that by articulating what is a sustainable model. We are totally capable of doing, uncreating what we created and creating something totally different because our survival requires it. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's our, it's our, um, it's our responsibility if we want to continue living. So I'm, I go, I certainly do vacillate between being scared and being totally uh, awestruck at this moment in history. Um, but when I'm with other people, like here and in Arcata, where I think 60% of the voters in Arcata voted for Peter Camejo for, for Green, uh, <laughs> governor of California. Um, so it's, it, it, this is a time, as Ron said and others said, this is an incredible time. And I wanna say, is leading into uh, the film, um, I got interested in Korea because I was in, had been in Vietnam, and when I, after I discovered that Vietnam was a fraud, I started going back and looking at all the other wars. And the first war I, of course, went to was Korea, because it was only 10 years before Vietnam. And I discovered, gee, we brought Syngman Rhee from the United States over to South Korea in 1945 to be our ruler in South Korea, which we insisted on occupying after the Japanese defeat. In, and all the Koreans, virtually all the Koreans except the wealthy Koreans that had worked with the Japanese, who had occupied Korea for 40 years, um, they were in opposition to the United States. The U.S. troops came in on September 8, 1945. Korea had announced its new sovereignty on September 2nd, six days earlier same day that Ho Chi Minh announced independence for Vietnam. And I thought, wow, here's these, all these people trying to have their own life. And these Western powers insisting on continuing these old patterns, which are required if we want to continue living an exploitive life. Because we really do need to have these areas where we steal. This is the, this is the part that my parents just couldn't get. And I understand, it's tough. It's a tough reality. It's shocking to realize that 4.5% of the world's population have been consuming 40% of the world's resources at gunpoint. How else do you steal like that? You have to steal it with a gun in people's face. And I have to always say I'm so sorry to the Vietnamese and to the Nicaraguans and to the Salvadorans and all the other places that the United States has been where I have visited, I really feel tremendous grief for this pain and suffering that we created for people that are far more authentic, I believe, than I was in Vietnam. I realize I'm really not a very authentic person. I'm just an, I'm kind of an ideological robot. These people were in their villages where they had been for hundreds of years. So we have this moment that we of reckoning. And if this moment really continues to unfold as it has been in the last few months, we can't predict just how incredibly powerful uh, we are to say we're taking our power back. We are not cooperating. Even if you take off my arm, I'm not going to cooperate. Even if I have to go to prison or if you want to deport me, I can't agree with what you're doing. It's against my own nature. Just one more thing about Korea. When I kept studying uh, U.S. history in Korea, some of you might have heard about the Taft-Katsura Agreement. It was 1905. 
It was an agreement between the, New York, the, the U.S. Secretary of State, Taft, and the Japanese Foreign Minister, Katsura. And it was an agreement at the end of the, of the Russo-Japanese War that the Japanese had almost won, but they asked uh, Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt, to intervene to end the conflict. Well, the United States had recently taken the Philippines during the Spanish-American War and after the Spanish-American War, and that was considered in Japanese territory. So there was an, a deal made in 1905 that we, the United States, would let Japan have Korea if we could have the Philippines unimpeded. That was the first real assault on the Korean people who had been unified for 5,000 years as a single culture. And I thought, wow, I've got to keep going back and studying this history. I've got to go back to the Mexican-American War. I've got to go back to the War of 1812. I've got to go to the Revolutionary War. I've got to look at the Founding Fathers. I've got to look at all these Puritans and look at their statements going back to the 1600s. What was it going on here on this continent? There was something quite different than the story that we all were told. Read some of the early Puritan statements about the indigenous. It's pretty disgusting. The arrogance and the ethnocentrism and the racism that have dominated our culture have been almost beyond comprehension for most of our citizenry. It is very deep. And um, it, of course, it makes it very easy to go all over the world and pluck the fruit and then say you're civilizing people. You're bringing them Christianity, and, uh, you're, and you're relieving them of their resources that they, don't, that they don't know how to deal with. So I met Mickey Grant when I saw his film, Coochie Tunnels. I saw it at a film festival. I didn't know Mickey, but it was the first film I'd seen of the Vietnam War from the Vietnamese perspective, from the Viet Cong perspective. With, US, with English subtitles. And I was so impressed with the film, I went up and introduced myself to Mickey at the film festival, and I said, boy, that's the first time I've really seen a film that talks about the war from the, from the perspective of the Viet Cong. And um, we started talking, and the next thing we knew, we decided that we wanted to make films disclosing the hidden history of the United States. And the first film we took on was The Hidden History of U.S. and Korea because it's so relevant to why, how the North Koreans think today and how, why there is so much animosity in the South against the United States that's not reported in the Western press. I've been over there eight times. We've interviewed hundreds of people both in the North and the South, survivors of, of massacres that happened 50 years ago. So um, this has all become just you know, part of my learning in this lifetime about the history of my government and my culture and in some way I guess trying to make atonement for the fact that I was so ignorant I was so ignorant that I followed orders to go across the ocean to participate in murdering people that I didn't know anything about or anything about their history now that is an incredible feat and that dynamic has been going on for several thousand years in different empires big and small, but it didn't make me feel any better after I recognized it. It's like, how could that happen? Where was my soul? Where has been our soul? Where is our soul? I'm hoping that what we are going to see in the next, next week, next month, next year, next decade, is we are going to discover our soul. And our soul connects us with everything and everybody. Deep. It goes deep. Very deep. And if we find our soul, we find our health. And we find our health and soul, we find our power. And we can do whatever, whatever that voice is suggesting we do because we're now connected with the awesome power of the cosmos. I don't mean to be spacey, but this is physics, cosmology, theology, psychology that's all converging to understand the interconnectedness of everything.
and the sacredness of everything, including us. So, what, uh, finally, I want to say that there's been a Korean in Los Angeles area recently arrested as a spy. He was a store owner. It's a ridiculous story, but a lot of the Koreans that were going to be here today are so terrified to come out in public to a political event that they would not come. And uh, let's hope that those of us that are Eurocentric don't let our Eurocentric white male leaders intimidate us so that we uh, stay home or actually people, whatever you, whatever you need to do, just do it. But let's help each other overcome any intimidation we might feel, including myself. I, I must say, I, I, you know, I need help too to continue on this course. So, with that, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I want to conclude my remarks and saying I'm thankful that I've survived this experience because uh, I am an emotional, kind of an emotional wreck these days. Um, and we do have, um, I guess, um, Frank and. Don are going to say something, and then for those who want, we have um, pictures, slides from Vietnam and that start telling our story. Uh, thank you for bearing with me. On September 1st, 1987, S. Brian Wilson began a protest at the Concord Naval Weapons Station near Oakland, California. That's one of the places that send out the weapons that have killed or injured tens of thousands of people in Central America. Brian delivered a letter to the base commander telling him that on that day he'd begin using his body to block the trains carrying his weapons. His hope was that if they stopped the train to save one human life, they were not far from understanding they could also stop it from destroying many human lives, each of equal value in Central America. They must have known he meant business. One year earlier, with three other veterans, he'd gone without food for 36 days on the steps of the Capitol to persuade Congress to stop the killing in Central America. Brian Wilson, former high school jock, former Air Force security officer in Vietnam, former dairy farmer who'd received a commendation for his work with the traumatized veterans of Vietnam, was run over that day. He'd put himself in the place of the people of Central America, and in doing so, he opened up the deepest truths of human existence. For the life and times of Brian Wilson had turned him into a satyagrahi, a practitioner of the nonviolent resistance to evil. The path taken by Martin Luther King, Mahatma Gandhi, and Archbishop Romero of El Salvador. Brian trusted that even greater than the power of a speeding train is the power of truth and love. He showed a new kind of heroism, the kind that may just bring the world back from the brink of self-destruction. He acted on his faith in the unity and sanctity of all life, and that if one person will speak and act upon this truth, it will open the hearts of many and provide us a way out in this most desperate moment. 5% of the people of the world live in the United States, but we consume 40% of the resources of the world. We have become used to thinking that we have a right to all that we have, no matter what damage we do to the earth or to other people. We have become detached and disconnected from reality. We have become detached from the earth. We have become detached from the feelings and lives of people elsewhere if it interferes with our right to maintain our lifestyle and standard of living. I would submit to you that we're on a course leading to inevitable annihilation. Martin Luther King said the issue is not between violence and nonviolence, it's between nonviolence and non-existence. The course we're on in the first world is a course of ultimate destruction. Do we want to be part of this course of ultimate destruction or do we want to be part of hope and affirmation and justice for all people of the earth and for the earth itself 
without which we cannot live. Yes, I'm talking about a nonviolent revolution of consciousness, a consciousness that is able to understand how we're all inextricably connected to each other on this earth and to the earth itself. And that if we violate those fundamental principles, we do so at our own peril. Yes, we can continue to live in this delusion and the denials of reality because it's painful, it's frightening, sometimes it's terrifying. Just as Vietnam vets have understood, it's terrifying to face the truth, especially when you don't have anybody to talk to. How can we continue as a civilization of we the people if we have to do it at the, at the expense of maiming and murder of people all over the world, whether it's in Angola or El Salvador or Guatemala or Nicaragua or Campuchia or Vietnam or South Africa? Are we going to watch this happen again? Do we just go about our business as usual and know that another 5,000 people will be killed in our name? Or do we have to think about a paradigm shift that somehow is able to experience the anguish of the earth and the anguish of the Nicaraguans and the anguish of the El Salvadorans whose lives are being threatened by our guns and our money because we have to protect our national security? Well, I hope and I challenge all of you to think, but more importantly, to feel in your heart how you might be able to act in such a way so that the world can live in peace and justice. And I'm liberated. I'm free to stand anywhere, any place, and tell them they cannot continue to kill mothers and fathers and children in my name as a citizen of the United States. So I ask each of you to search your hearts as to what your truth is for being a citizen of the earth, promoting justice as a foundation for peace. It's not going to happen magically, and I think it's not going to happen by relying on these political structures and institutions in Washington. I think we're going to have to wage peace in the most extraordinary ways whether our government wants it or not. And so I simply say that you will know in your heart, I believe, what to do. But I know that without a nonviolent revolution of consciousness, we will not survive as a civilization or as a planet. We are an at an extraordinary point in history where we can choose to have peace if we want to pay the price. And what more glorious goal and value do we want than peace for all people? And so I look forward to working together with you all, with we the people, to build a new society, a society that understands that we are not worth more and they are not worth less and that we will be willing to pay the price and take the risks to wage peace with all fellow and sister human beings. I feel ever more empowered to wage unconditional peace